This uh, webinar is um, addressed the EA, EIC uh, accelerator uh, equity part and the due diligence process. Um, so, uh, concepts like value creation, uh, uh, strategy for raising funding are now analyzed uh, on the EIC accelerator uh, proposals. So, the connection with the European financial ecosystems and the European capital markets is critical for the success of this model. So, um, because the main target of uh, the, the EIC investment is to uh, have a successful exit. Today's webinar, we'll have um, a brief uh, word from our uh, NCP network coordinator, Antonio Carboni. Uh, then, Pedro Ribeiro Santos will take the floor where, uh, where he will address the perspective from a, a private invex, um, investor. Um, uh, then we we'll have uh, uh, Stefan Waki from the, the European Commission, uh, where uh, you, um, you will pre present the, um, uh, the um, state of play on the implementation of the EIC accelerator. Uh, and finally, we have um, Yu Zheng and Fabrizio Morgera from the European Investment Bank uh, as the um, uh, EIC accelerator advisor um, on the investment. Um, and we'll have a, a detailed uh, presentation on the equity part. Um, this, uh, we, are, we will have room for questions yeah. after the end well, I mean, of the, uh, each uh, presentation. So I can, uh, kindly ask you to um, put your questions on the chat box. Um, and this event will be available online on the uh, Access to EIC uh, web page. And now I will give the floor to Antonio Carboni, the NCP coordinator of this network. Antonio? Thank you so much, Alexandre. Uh, first of all, let me thank you for the very good organization of this training. Thank you, Christina, all the ANI staff. And let me thank you, of course, also the speakers that will intervene today uh, and our colleagues NCPs. Of course, I hope all of you and your loved ones are doing well and uh, you are all returning to normal life or to a new normal life. I will spend just a few words. I think the training of today is really, really important. It's a kind of follow-up of the NCP's training we organized last in the end of last April. Of course, today, uh, I think we have the opportunity to, get re to go really into details about the operational details, the first operational lessons learned of the equity part, due diligence part, due diligence processes of the ESE accelerator. And as we know, the equity part, the blended finance is the, uh, one of the big novelties of this ESE pilot. I think we all know that a, a couple of days ago, the commission uh, officially announced the establishment of the ESE fund. So the mechanism, the vehicle that will manage the equity part of the accelerator. But I think it's really, really interesting also start with uh, Mr. Pedro Ribeiro Santos intervention that I'm sure he will provide us a comprehensive picture on the, let's say, the most important aspects of equity in the seed and early stages. And also, you know, I, I know that Pedro will talk about the, uh, the experience of the InnoFin te technology transfer process. Uh, just a few words on access to ESE. As you know very well, uh, we, we, we had to reshuffle, to review a bit our activities, including training plan activities for obvious reasons. Uh, in the meantime, over the last few months, in any case, we arranged some trainings for NCPs, some info days for the large public. As you know, we came up with some uh, first access to see products. I'm talking about uh, the, the annotated template for the accelerator, so the new version, but also on the Fed Pathfinder side, we published different instruments, different tools. So 
as usual, uh, uh, ensure the uh, largest dissemination of those tools because we think that uh, they will facilitate the life both for us NCPs in our information advising uh, uh, activities, but also for the potential applicants of uh, the EAC pilot course. For your information, and that's it from my side, uh, uh, on the access to EAC side, uh, we would like to extend the project because the current end date of the project has been set up in December 2020. Our aim, together with the Commission, is to go ahead at least till the first semester of 21, also because I think uh, we think that uh, it will facilitate the transition from Horizon 2020 and the ESC pilot to the fully fledged ESC of Horizon Europe. And I think that the first months, the first year of the new framework program are really important also for us NCPs and I'm sure that access to ESC might be the instrument to uh, you know uh, have continuous updating training for us ncps in order to forward to transfer this knowledge towards the applicants at the national level so that's it from my side i leave the floor to uh, pedro ribeiro santos pedro thank you very much for being here also from my side the floor is yours Okay, thank you very much, Alessandro and Antonio, um, and thank you everyone for, for the opportunity to sort of uh, share the views to set the stage for this, this webinar with the views from uh, the private investor. Let me uh, try and share my, sc my screen here. Okay. Here we go. You can all see the screen? Okay. Um, yes. So again, thanks for, for, for the opportunity to, to make this introduction. Um, so I'll, I'll share the views from, from the private investor side uh, and for the next uh, 45 minutes, I'll speak on one hand, well, just a brief, a brief introduction of who RELR Venture Partners is and what we've been doing. And in particular, uh, the, the, the recent experience that we've had uh, raising a technology transfer fund uh, with the support of, of Enofin um, and the European Investment Fund. Um, uh, and uh, as for the second part of the presentation, I'll also talk about a little bit uh, the, the, uh, the, the criteria or the process uh, for, for assessing and investing in investment opportunities and seed and pre-seed stages that we do um, from a, a private investor's perspective again. So starting off uh, with uh, who Army Love Venture Partners is, uh, very, very briefly, we've been around for quite a while. Uh, for Portugal and Europe, it's, it's a long time to be 20 years uh, in, in venture capital. Uh, we're uh, a fully independent uh, uh, venture capital uh, investor, although we didn't start that way. Uh, initially, 20 years ago, when we started, we were part of uh, one of the, the large Portuguese banks. But for the last five years, we've become fully independent from that. Um, currently, we raise, uh, uh, sorry, we manage a uh, total uh, asset center management of about 20, 260 million euros uh, across uh, six different funds um, uh, and we've always been uh, more if you will by, by DNA of the people here than actually for, for many strategic uh, reasoning. We've always been what is now called deep tech. Uh, 20 years ago there was not such a term uh, but essentially we, we've always looked to do investments in uh, companies that have uh, a very strong technology component uh, very often based on, on science and technological uh, R&D um, just because the people here and all of us investment team uh, have that sort of background. Uh, all of us are, uh, have a, a background in engineering or science. My background is in physics and then it moved on to into business consulting. And so all of us had a, a bit of a experience and track record before that we formed uh, this, this team. So we have that preference for technology based uh, companies in general. And within that, uh, uh, we don't limit a lot in, in terms of, of uh, the different industries that we can invest in that. Uh, we're a multi-geography uh, funds or funds manager. Uh, just by the nature of it, as you can imagine, 20 years ago, there was not uh, a lot of uh, investment opportunities or deal flow, as we call it, uh, in Portugal. Uh, even in Europe, it was pretty scarce. Uh, and 20 years ago, when we started, we didn't know a lot about venture capital. So... It was essential and instrumental for us to start investing outside uh, in the US in particular with some good, very experienced investors uh, around the table. 
that uh, was uh, instrumental again for us to, to learn about venture capital, to establish a bit of a network. And then as the uh, European and Portuguese ecosystems really started to evolve a decade ago, maybe, um, then we started investing uh, closer to home. Uh, we're also multi-stage, but we typically stay at the uh, Series A at the most. So we do from pre-seed, even from technology transfer, as we speak to, uh, about in a second, uh, to seed and, and to Series A. We've done also a few Series B investments, uh, but essentially we're, we're an early stage investor. Um, we've done a multitude, uh, a few tens of investments uh, across the world um, and have had the, you know, been fortunate enough really to have uh, uh, portfolio companies that have enabled us uh, to have top performance in terms of returns to our investor. We've returned uh, the investors uh, money uh, several times over uh, with, with top performing companies and portfolio. But I'll talk more a little bit more about that. <clears throat> so these are uh, the funds that we've been uh, uh, managing. Um, so the funds, uh, so when we started off in 2000, we really, as I said, we were part of a bank, so we were investing out of the bank's balance sheet. Uh, that's been uh, closed. All the investments have been uh, profitably returned. Uh, and then we raised two funds, so the, the two, two ones at the top here, funds two and three, uh, there were uh, 90 to 100 million euro uh, funds uh, investing globally. So a lot of it was US uh, and, and, and the rest of it is uh, mostly Europe and Portugal. Um, at the early stage uh, in fund two, you'd have, you'd be, you see recognizable names such as Chip Idea, which was one of the first uh, Portuguese success stories in, in tech. Uh, TXVIA was a US company that was sold to Google. OutSystems was, is uh, the first uh, homegrown Portuguese uh, unicorn. Uh, in Fund 3, you'd find names such as Feedsai, uh, not yet formally a unicorn, but a very successful Portuguese company. Safety Pay, a very successful payments company from the US also. And then uh, by the time that we reached this point, so around 2010, 2011, that's when really the ecosystem here started to develop. And <clears throat> we raised two additional funds. One of them was what we call Fund 4, a small 10 million euro fund to start investment, just focus uh, on Portugal. And then this particular fund, which is particularly interesting for our conversation, uh, the iStart, which was uh, our initial, uh, initial test of doing technology transfer investments. So we hadn't done any of that sort up until that point in time, but we really started to see um, uh, very interesting opportunities uh, uh, coming about from uh, the academic uh, ecosystems or the academic environments uh, in Portugal, uh, very interesting uh, investment uh, opportunities and proposals that our traditional funds, so to say, were not very uh, much geared to do, but we, th we, we were tempted to do in any case. So <clears throat> we, we decided uh, to, to uh, set up this small fund, just a 3 million euro fund, really to test the thesis of investments uh, of doing technology transfer uh, uh, in Portugal. Uh, and even though it's a small, very small fund, it's doing very well. It's in the, one of the, well, the, the more well-known investment in there is a company called Codacy, uh, well-known in Portugal. They won the Web Summit uh, competition uh, back, way back when, when we were just starting and now a pretty sizable company. So even though that is a very, very small fund with uh, very limited uh, uh, capabilities and you know, very much constrained by small size, it's doing considerably well. Uh, and that has led us to raise this uh, fund five, which is the fund that we have actively investing right now, uh, which is a, a European uh, uh, technology transfer fund. So it's aimed, and I'll talk about that fund more in particular, but it's in general, it's uh, a more than 50 million euro fund to invest in technology transfer opportunities uh, across Europe. Uh, and so going very, very early, working a lot with universities and, and uh, research institutions and labs to extract uh, investment opportunities out of the science and the R&D that's being done there. And then very recently, we've also raised a, 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 an additional fund to invest in technologies strictly related to uh, the, the rollout of 5G communications across uh, Europe and across, across Portugal in particular. Right. So this is just a, a, an overview of, of uh, the, the, the funds that we've, uh, we've been managing. And like I said before, we've always been 
um, very much technology oriented as investors. Uh, that's been you know, treating us well. Um, and uh, more recently, this, is, uh, uh, this has been proving out to be very, very much a trend uh, across Europe. Uh, more and more we've seen uh, investments uh, in deep tech uh, uh, increasing in size, increasing in number of deals and, and increasing in interest uh, in terms of uh, the, the deals that, that are uh, being presented to us uh, and the deal flow that's being directed to us. Um, and we, we're strong believers that this is um, uh, uh, a, a great avenue of development uh, for Europe in general. Uh, you know, it's very hard to compare Europe and everybody does those sorts of comparisons every day between Europe and the US. Of course, the US being the, the world's more mature, uh, most mature venture capital market and industry. Uh, and it's very hard to compare because, you know, the US and Silicon Valley has tens, uh, as decades uh, ahead of us. Uh, but when we look at uh, deep tech, that things are not so unbalanced. Um, uh, and we've seen that Europe has, has presented a lot of uh, very interesting uh, opportunities in companies based on fundamental research and born out of, of research. Uh, when we look at our deal flow, so these are investment opportunities that are, that are directed to Armilar, which of course they will be skewed a little bit because of just the investors that we are. Uh, but if we look at our deal flow across Europe and in Portugal in particular, so Europe on the left-hand side, Portugal on the right, and if you look in particular into seed and pre-seed deal flow, so companies that are really just starting, uh, about half of it uh, comes from university uh, ecosystems, defined largely, so from uh, uh, directly from university as spin-offs, or uh, uh, incubated at a university-related uh, incubator, um, uh, uh, developed by, by uh, researchers from certain universities, etc. So more than 40% of what comes to us in seed stage from Europe comes from, uh, from universities across Europe. And if, of course, if we look into Portugal, uh, where naturally the, the, the seed and pre-seed uh, has a, a biggest a bigger share, almost 90% of our, our deal flow, more than half, almost 60% comes from the main universities uh, across Portugal. Uh, so we really see that as an as a, as important trend, uh, an important area of development. And this is in particular, when it comes to Portugal, what has uh, enabled Portugal to really be punching above its weight in terms of the, uh, the, the companies, the successful companies that it has been creating. Um, of course, it, it is a small country, it will remain a small country, but when you put it in, in perspective in, relation, in, in comparison to GDP, or even more so uh, related to the investment capacity that exists locally, which is still very scarce, uh, you see that Portugal is really one of the top performers across Europe. So what we see, of course, I'm using as a proxy the, the unicorns, which is a flawed measure, uh, I know, by many accounts, but it's, it's where data is more uh, available. So what we're seeing on the left-hand side is unicorns uh, per GDP in terms of number and in terms of value. And then on the right-hand side, uh, unicorns uh, divided by investment capacity of the last 10 years. Uh, again, in terms of in both in number of unicorns and in value of unicorns. Uh, and it's clear, clearly a, a, a very good performer that we're seeing here. Um, uh, just a, a, as, a, as a footnote, this chart on the right does not include Romania because that's a complete outlier. They have very, very little investment capacity and one huge unicorn, which is UiPath, so it would be off the charts here. <clears throat> but this is, this is a very interesting uh, uh, chart and data point um, that uh, we've been producing these companies and when we look and deep dive into these companies, what they are, maybe with the exception of one, which is uh, Farfetch, um, they've been really based on deep tech and, 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 and proprietary technology. Uh, if you compare, for example, with, with other countries in, in Europe uh, that have been you know, maybe uh, equally successful in terms of number of unicorns created, uh, just but being uh, larger countries, in many cases we find that there are uh, uh, successful companies, nothing wrong with them, 
but that they are uh, uh, sometimes copycats of, of existing technologies that have done well in, in the US. And again, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just not what we do. But we find it really more interesting uh, to, to, to have that competitive advantage created by technology and by the differentiation that technology can offer. So this, this whole trend, plus the experience that we've had with that small uh, 3 million euro fund that, we, that I talked about earlier, that we, we again created just as a test bed uh, for, for trying uh, transfer to, uh, technology transfer investments, that has led us then to create this, this fund that we've uh, just raised, uh, that we started investing out of, uh, the technology transfer fund. Uh, so the, the leading um, uh, idea here is really to access this leading emerging, uh, emerging and largely in South European community, which is Portugal. Uh, again, which has very small investment capacity across the board, uh, but is attracting a lot of interest from international uh, investors precisely because the opportunities are so interesting and that there's not a lot of uh, local competition and not a lot of uh, local investment capacity. Uh, so we're, we're, we're created this fund as a way for uh, investors in both national and international to have, to have access to, to, to the deal flow that is, uh, that is coming up here. Um, to a well-resourced deep tech seed venture fund, uh, and by well resourced, what I mean by that is, of course, it needs to be a fund that can uh, support the, the more successful companies throughout their, uh, their life uh, at different stages. Um, and to invest, of course, in technology based businesses that stem from top academic institutions in Portugal and across Europe. Uh, of course, we want to have world class investors here, world class entrepreneurs, technology institutions. Uh, and managed by uh, what what we really think is uh, are the, uh, the the more experienced uh, VC manager uh, in Portugal, which is of course uh, ourselves. This was not an easy task uh, raising uh, this fund. Uh, from uh, the day we started, uh, it took us two years to do the first closing of the fund, um, which we did uh, in February two thousand nineteen. Um, Interestingly, though, uh, even though we had set a minimum of, of 30 million for that fund to function, we did that first closing at 46 million euros. Um, we've had uh, the great support, uh, uh, in principally of, from the public sector financing of the European Investment Fund, uh, managing different sources of funding, in particular, uh, managing uh, enough in uh, equity uh, on, on one pockets and also managing uh, a Portuguese fund of funds backed by the Portuguese state uh, through, through IFD. Um, they've been, uh, so the IF has been uh, with, with that team has been a great uh, uh, sponsor for, uh, for this fund, of course. They've been uh, with it from day one. They've done uh, a very, very extensive due diligence, a very intense process, uh, a very constructive one also, I have to say, but very intense and heavy uh, in the sense that they've gone and, and talked to uh, all the ecosystem, uh, traveled across the country, talking to universities and to, to research institutions, understanding the richness and the depth of the deal flow uh, to make sure that uh, the deal flow here can support uh, a fund of, of this size which is not a very big size, but for, for our country, it's, it's, it's pretty substantive. <clears throat> um, uh, of course, vouching the whole uh, plan, the, the whole investment thesis, uh, and of course, uh, establishing or negotiating with us the, the rules of functioning for, for this fund. Um, and, and of course, having uh, uh, the IF with us and that quality stamp is of course what also enabled us to then go out in the, into the markets and talk to, to other national and international investors to, to back for the, the remaining part of this fund. And we've been fortunate to set up a, a very rich mix of, of, of investors into this fund uh, from the corporate world, so from a large corporate here in Portugal called Simapa, uh, to international corporates uh, such as KPN, so the, the, the Dutch Telecom, um, I'm only listing the, the public ones here, uh, the ones that, that announced the investment in the funds, but there's, there's others also investors here. Importantly, even though it's just symbolically, um, we've, uh, we've also have uh, um, uh, universities or in academic institutions investing into our funds. Uh, so as an example, uh, Instituto Superior Tecnico here in Lisbon, which is the, the largest engineering school in Portugal, 
um, they, they've been investors in the fund as well. Of course, it's very, very hard to uh, um, uh, unlock uh, capital uh, from universities who, who typically, at least here in Portugal, are very, very much constrained and uh, most of them are public. Of course, they need to deal with, uh, with budgetary constraints, etc. cetera. Uh, so uh, uh, sometimes we've had uh, uh, only symbolical, really, uh, investments into the fund. Other times, a little bit more meaningful. Technical was, was a meaningful investment. Um, but, but it is important, of course, uh, when we, we raise and set up a technology transfer fund uh, to have the vouching from uh, the, the leading uh, uh, research and academic institutions, um, uh, to, which is also, of course, a, a means to ensure some, some degree of cooperation, uh, to ensure that we have access to that deal flow. And, and this is not something new, frankly, for us, uh, because we've historically been doing that with, with many of Portuguese universities. We very regularly uh, travel the, the country and go visit and, and help and talk to the teams, talk to the technology transfer offices there, um, help them uh, identify technologies that are there. We've been doing that for many years. This time we've done it a little bit more formally uh, to, with a view to this uh, technology transfer fund. Um, uh, and from the formal standpoint, of course, again, it's very important to have that, that vouching uh, from, from universities as investors into the fund. Um, we've had it also a few family offices and then a collection of, of private individuals, uh, including, and it's something that we're particularly proud of, founders from our uh, older portfolio companies, uh, of successful companies, including the founder of Thought Systems. There's others in there too. Uh, and I say that we're particularly proud of because this is really uh, uh, a sign of, of trust and confidence that we've worked with these people for a number of years in developing their own companies. Uh, and they're now sort of giving back. Uh, they, they, they view the value that we've uh, helped uh, uh, create and now also give, you know, the logic of giving back and hopefully basically making also profitable investments uh, backing uh, our fund. And then, of course, there's ourselves uh, as, as investors in the fund. So in total, we've completed uh, this, uh, this, uh, this fundraise uh, in f just in February, so <laughs> just prior to, to the lockdown, um, uh, with uh, uh, more than 50 million euros uh, committed from uh, a small collection of, of a very good mix of uh, investors. Now, uh, about uh, the fund itself. So we set it up to be a European scope fund, but with a strong focus in Portugal. So we've committed to deploy at least 50% of the funds uh, in Portugal. Uh, we're very confident from what we've seen and what we know of Portugal that uh, there's, there's enough opportunity to deploy those, that sort of amount here. Uh, but it's also important to, uh, to maintain an international presence. Uh, and, and of course, Europe is, is a little bit of our playground. Now, when you talk about um, pre-seed and technology transfer investments that can be really, really, really early on, just as companies spin off from universities, for example, uh, it's not easy to do that from uh, a large distance. Um, and so, you know, we've had and we have relationships with uh, a certain a number of, of European universities, but we're not there presently every day. <clears throat> and so it's not easy to uh, uh, be an investor from a distance at that, that stage of development where the companies uh, and the, the, the founding teams need a lot of support. Sometimes their teams are uh, incomplete. Sometimes they're very strong technically, but uh, lack uh, management skills and experience. <clears throat> uh, and therefore, this is not, uh, if we're not there every day, this is harder to do. So for those 30% outside of Portugal, the approach that we're taking is uh, going hand in hand with local investors. You know, so if we uh, find a, a company in Spain that we like, uh, we make sure uh, if we want to invest in it, that we have a local uh, Spanish investor uh, that you know that we we partner with to also invest locally. Uh, same same thing for for uh, other countries out there, and we've already done our international investment uh, from, from this fund. Um, uh, so th then this is critical. Uh, it's it's important for for the companies at this type of stage to. Uh, of course, have a, 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 an international set of investors that can help in different dimensions of the development of their business. Uh, but it's important also to have the, the trust of someone local 
uh, and it's it's important to have that vouching if you if you're a young company raising uh, capital at the very very early stages. <clears throat> so that's that's the approach that we're taking for uh, the international components uh, of the fund. <clears throat> now, um, what this fund invests in, and this is this is something that we've. Uh, we need to hammer down very clearly with each university and academic institution that we talk to. Uh, the fund, as by nature, of course, is made to invest in businesses, not science. Uh, so this means that we invest and are ready to invest if we see and feel that the fundamental research uh, and the fundamental R&D is complete. Uh, so there are no uh, big question marks as to uh, the validity of uh, uh, the, the technology that's been uh, researched. Now, it may be still a very, very early stage in the sense that it may not even be a product yet. Uh, it may just be uh, uh, the, the result of research, a technology in raw that needs to be turned into a product to be able to, to take to market and to commercialize. But again, the fundamental research needs to be done. The fund is not meant to support R&D fundamental R&D uh, and, and science projects. Uh, with small exception, we've reserved 10% of the capital to, uh, uh, if need be, uh, uh, finance proof of concept. So this is when, again, when the fundamental research has been done, but still we need to, I don't know, build a prototype. Um, it's not still, it's not a product yet, but we could just build a prototype that uh, categorically demonstrates the technology functioning. So again, it's not about doing R&D, it's not about doing fundamental research, it's about showing uh, uh, categorically that technology works. So a small portion of the fund can be used to, to do that even before the company uh, gets uh, incorporated. <clears throat> uh, in any case, the fund's uh, mantra is to uh, uh, make investments that directly lead to the commercialization of research outputs. Um, so again, and especially being a, a, a fund in a small country such as Portugal, it would be wrong to define technology transfer too strictly as we only invest in spin-offs from universities, for example. That would be wrong because that would just cut uh, the, the deal flow uh, to, to small numbers. And uh, as we'll see in a bit, this, this, the venture capital businesses need to look at a large number of, uh, of deal flow. Uh, so we've, we've uh, even though it is uh, undeniably a technology transfer fund, we need to define it um, uh, a little bit more broadly, not just restricted to spin-offs, but also to businesses that are licensing IP out of universities, uh, companies that, again, are going through acceleration or incubation programs at uh, incubators or accelerators that are, that are associated with universities, uh, startups created by former researchers of, of uh, universities and academic institutions, uh, not be, but be not being strict about what is an academic and uh, an, an R&D institution, but of course, as, as long as it produces uh, credible uh, R&D. Uh, so essentially, it is very important uh, to, uh, when we define a project and when we find an investment fund and define sort of the scope or the perimeter of the things, the deals that it can look at, that it can invest in, to make sure that there's a critical mass and not be too restrictive about uh, the, the, the definitions. So that's something that we've been very, very careful doing here. And that is something that uh, uh, the EIF and the team of Inofin that looked at, at, at this investment opportunity was also very careful at crafting together with us exactly what is the scope, what is the perimeter of the things that this fund can do within the realm of the technology transfer concepts, right? In terms of industry, again, from the standpoint of not being uh, uh, too narrowly defined, uh, there's really not a lot of boundaries uh, into uh, the, the, the sort of industries that we can do within information technology, health technology, clean technology. Um, uh, it's, it's uh, of course, there's certain, certain uh, customary prohibited sectors, of course, but within the realm of technologies, it's pretty broad. Now, our preference and our track record and our more successful stories have always been around uh, information technology, mostly in software, but also in hardware. Uh, so we're not, uh, our competencies do not lie in biotech, for example, or material science, uh, but, but the fund could do investments in that scope if, if the right opportunity came about also. <clears throat> 
very importantly, the, the stages that this fund can, can support. Um, this was a, a very strong limitation that we had from, from that little fund that I started to talk about earlier. Uh, and that we had to do without here. So the fund is designed to, yes, enter very, very early on with small few hundred thousand euro tickets into companies that are just being formed. But a very important capacity of the fund, say two thirds to three quarters of the funds, it is, is reserved to do following investments. And this is something that for the mathematics of uh, venture capital is really important to make sure that we are able to double down on the best companies. Uh, so we're not going to be doing follow-on investments into all the investments that we've invested at this, this uh, pre-seed and seed stage, but of those that are doing well, and if they're doing well, then there's enough capacity in the fund to keep supporting them through different stages, preferably with rounds uh, uh, led by uh, new investors coming in that will price the round, that will lay the terms, but, but with, with this fund having enough capacity to invest. Now this, from an investor in the fund's perspective is very interesting because being the bulk of the investment capacity is a, a still venture capital risk, uh, but it's, it's a decision of investment that is being done with a lot of information. We've been working with these companies for some time um, and therefore are able to, to vouch uh, the, the, the investment decision much better than we would have if we were just looking at this company for the first time. Uh, for the company, from this company's perspective, it's also very interesting to know that if they're performing well, then this investor has enough capacity to, to support them in the future. And that is really, really important as the company moves forward and, and goes on to raise successive rounds. <clears throat> um, so the fund has already started deploying. Uh, we've done eight investments so far. We're about to close our ninth investment. A range of different uh, industries and, and, and different types of technology from, you know, from artificial intelligence, of course, to parallel computing, to blockchain, um, uh, very, very, to, to cloud storage, very, very diverse from different number of institutions um, and also started deploying internationally with uh, first uh, uh, investment in fund with a company at top here, Appenture, doing parallel computing out of the University of Coruña that we did again with a, a local Spanish fund. Uh, so, so far we've deployed uh, and invested more than 4.5 million euros uh, in this, this, which in, in this early stage, so it's been a little bit over a year, is, is, is a very satisfactory rate of, of deployment. We're very happy with the portfolio that's been building up. Um, again, in terms of investment criteria and also already making the bridge for the second part of the presentation, uh, well, we've uh, sort of try to define uh, objective investment criteria. Um, for, we, we need to be sure that the company is using uh, very unique technology uh, developed at one of the partner institutions or universities. Um, and we need to be convinced that it, this is the best in its field as far as we can tell and as far as we can research. Uh, clearly the IP needs to be fully allocated to the project and we all need to be aligned that the objective here is to commercialize uh, the, the technology. Um, but always the objective is business, is business development, it's making a company that makes money that becomes profitable. Um, so we need to uh, make sure that this is not a technology or a solution looking for a problem, which is something that we find sometimes, but it's actually a solution to a very meaningful problem uh, that has business potential, that has, uh, has a, a global addressable market of, of a meaningful size. Um, and uh, with demonstrable signs of, of interest from, from the market. Uh, sometimes when we go in very, very early, there's not really yet a business plan. Uh, and sometimes we, we help build the business plan while we're looking at the opportunity. Uh, but at least the fundamentals of this is the opportunity that's being addressed and this opportunity is of this size globally, that needs to be, be there. Um, uh, this I've said before, so it's, it, it can be a very, very stage of development, but capable of fast growth, which means that, again, the fundamental research needs to be concluded. Uh, there's demonstrable result, results to be, to be observed. And we, can, we need to be comfortable that we can achieve a, the transformation of a technology into a product that can be taken into the market within 12 months of, uh, of funding and with less than a million years of, of funding. Uh, so that's the overall uh, goal. Uh, of course, we need to be very, very comfortable with the team. Also, I'll, I'll 
talk a little bit more about that uh, later on. Uh, when we talk about technology transfer, this is not very easy because sometimes you, the research has been done by uh, people that are academic by nature that don't want to uh, leave their university jobs. Uh, and that can be a problem. So we, we, we feel that we always need to include the key researchers as the entrepreneurial team that must be fully dedicated to the project. <clears throat> and that can be uh, worked sometimes uh, with, with agreements with universities, etc. Uh, something that we also very find very often is that there are, there are gaps in the team, especially in management and entrepreneurial skills, just because there's not that experience. Uh, that's okay. Uh, at least we need to be clear of what those gaps, the, what those gaps are, and how and when they can be filled uh, to make sure that we take this product uh, into market. And of course, at the end of the day, they need to offer a, a, a large uh, evaluation potential, which at the end of the day is what we're trying to, to obtain for our own investors uh, into the fund. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> when we look at the follow-on investments. Uh, we need to see that there's, there's been a successful completion of the market entry uh, targets and goals. We continue to believe in, in, in the potential of the business. Uh, the company, the, the product is now ready to take to market. Maybe there were a few first sales or implementations of the technology. So we continue to see evidence that it's something unique and that the market can, can take interest in. And now we need to see the, the complete team um, and desirably also interest from external investors that now have a, a look at the company at a little bit of, of an, a later stage and already uh, seeing some traction and have de-risked, if you will, uh, the technology risk that we've taken by entering so early uh, into the business. Okay. So this uh, specifically about the technology transfer fund. Now, what I've also been invited to do is talk a little bit about uh, our investment uh, process and how we look at opportunities. Uh, some, some of this, of course, may be applicable to how the EIC is going to look at investment opportunities, but of course, take into account this is from a private investor's perspective. Uh, and of course, even not all private investors will have the same methods and criteria and approach, but at least this, this is uh, ours and I hope this is, you find something useful in it for you. Uh, let me start with a, a basic premise, which is this. Uh, in general, investors prefer to have false negatives than false positives. A false negative being uh, a, a company that an investor decided to pass and not invest, and then it turns out to be a successful company. A false positive is the opposite of that. It's something that the investor decided they wanted to invest, they saw the potential, and it turns out to be an unsuccessful company. Uh, so I'll say this again, investors will prefer false negatives to false positives. Um, so the false negatives, they can be a, a bitter thing. Uh, uh, you know, they will stick with the investor maybe for the rest of its life as, as a bit of a regret. Um, but if you will allow me the analogy, it's like, you know, a, a date that didn't go anywhere. Uh, and then the person turns out to be hugely successful and gorgeous. You know, you may regret it in the long term. You know, but you do so with a smile on your face of, you know, a lost opportunity uh, and even some pride that you had the opportunity to look at it. Uh, you know, it's something that you tell uh, and, and, and go over to your friends over a cup of coffee and, and regret it. Uh, and there's very successful investors that have turned down very successful deals. You know, for example, one of the most experienced uh, and more successful uh, VCs on the planet, uh, Bessemer, uh, they publish on their website, what they call the entry portfolio, and which is essentially things that they've passed and that they now see that they shouldn't have passed. And it's things like they passed on an investment in Apple uh, before Apple did an IPO because they thought a $60 million valuation was outrageously expensive. You know, they passed on Airbnb for the same kind of reason. They passed on eBay, they passed on Facebook, they passed on Google. Um, they passed on FedEx several times. More recently, they passed on Zoom in 2014. So, you know, we'd be, we'd be using one of their portfolio companies if, if they hadn't passed. Uh, and again, they're the most, one of the most successful investors here, but they proudly list those and, and tell you these funny stories as uh, why and, and how they passed. So these are the false negatives. Now, the false positives, that's a very different story. Um, you know, an investor will live with them for years. 
and they will be very, very expensive. And it's not just about the money that's been invested into those companies that will eventually get lost because it, it's an unsuccessful uh, investment, but it's also the investor's share of mind and the time that they spend and the effort that they spend trying to help and trying in some, in some cases even to rescue an investment that's been made and it's turning out to be a bad one. Um, and at the end, you know, it turned out to be, uh, to be a zero. Uh, and they, they, they will have spent a lot of time and effort and money, of course, also in trying to, to help those companies and it's sustained that will stay with the, comp with the investor for a long time. So to keep the same analogy, so it, the date went well, turned into a marriage, and then the marriage went terribly wrong. Because these, these are marriages. These, when we, when an investor, when a venture capital does investor investment into a company, it's, been, it's, it's going to look at working with that company for six, seven, 10, sometimes more uh, years. Uh, that lasts more than, than many marriages, uh, unfortunately, these days. So, so it, that is a, a very, very uh, expensive uh, uh, thing to do, uh, to have a, a false positive. So as a result, um, it's only normal that the investors are constantly scanning when they're looking at investment opportunities for a reason not to invest. If there are signs, yellow and red flags that are raised, uh, then it's more likely than the investor would decide not to invest out of caution. Uh, and you cannot really blame an investor for being too picky and to, to identify things that put an, inv off a, off an investor is not uh, too hard of an exercise. And sometimes it's a very little things. Uh, the idea is that in the end, uh, the investor will only invest in those projects in which he's had, he has seen very little flaws, very few flaws, and a very large potential. And still, he knows that he will be wrong most of the time. Uh, and that's also a very important uh, point. Let me share some stats uh, with you on that point to make sure that I get this message across. So what we're going to look at here is uh, a distribution or a histogram, if you will, of, of uh, uh, the, the, the returns uh, obtained by venture capital investments. So these are uh, investments actually made. Uh, this is a little, a little bit uh, old, so this dates back from 2014, but I've recently looked at the new data and it's, the story is exactly the same, so I didn't even go through the effort of, of updating the slide. It wouldn't change anything. So what it looks like is it looked at US uh, investments, uh, almost uh, 22,000 uh, investments made into companies, and then Few, many or few years later, looked at what those investors, uh, investments returned uh, uh, in, net, in, term, in net terms to their investors after the divestment is being made. And so on, on uh, the horizontal charts here, you're going to see several buckets. So from zero to one, which is lost investments, then to one to five times the investment, five to 10, et cetera. Now, first bucket here, zero to one. So almost two thirds of the investments made lose money. And I don't have the, the detail here, the breakdown here, but I can tell you that more than half of this is actually zero, okay? So investments made where the investment is being lost is nearly two thirds of the investments made. Then I start raising the bar here, okay? One to five times the investment uh, returned that's 25%, so about uh, one in four, okay? Five to 10 times, 6%. So one in 15 to 20 companies returns five to 10 times the investment. Then 10 to 20 times, 2.5%. So one in 40 returns 10 to, 10, 10 to 20 times the investment. Then 20 to 20 times, 1%. So one in 100 makes this kind of returns. And then you get north of 50%, 0.4%. Sorry, in more than 50 times returned, 0.4%. So that's one in 250 companies invested uh, has these kinds of returns. Now, when you do the math, um, it's easy to understand that the venture capital model does not work if the portfolios are not able to find companies in this side of the spectrum. Right. So this is why venture capital is, is so, so much of a risky business, because if you have one fund, one building one portfolio in which you know, the fund will have you know, 20 to 30 companies, uh, and he, if in those companies there's not one of these, 
again, this is one in 100, one in 250, then the fund is not going to return its capital, right? Uh, and this is the art and science of, of venture capital. And it's very harsh thing in reality to, 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 to always have in mind. Um, and also based on these stats, it's actually very easy to see that actually the false negatives are also something that is very expensive for VCs. So if a company uh, that is largely successful is so rare, uh, based on what we're seeing here, um, then missing out on one is actually an expensive choice uh, from the venture capital to make. Uh, lose, missing out on an opportunity of having one of these companies is not something that he wants to do. So again, false negatives are also very, very expensive, just as, 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 as false positives are. Uh, but uh, uh, you know, being <laughs> with human beings that VCs also are, despite of some popular opinion, uh, the false negatives are just easier to deal with uh, from a human standpoint and from an evaluation standpoint. Okay. <clears throat> so having made this point, uh, let me take you through a little bit of the the process of what well, the typical process, certainly hours of of uh, uh, an investment uh, funnel. Uh, and so we'll take it here from, from the top. So an, an investment opportunity that comes in, as we call it a qualified opportunity. Uh, it'll go through different stages, uh, being an analysis and negotiation and then eventually closed. And it will have different checkpoints. So let me try and describe what this is. At the top of the funnel here, we're talking many hundreds and many hundreds. In you know, our case, and we're not, a very big investor, we're larger in Portugal, but that's a small thing to say. We see something like anywhere between, uh, in any given year, 600 to 800 investment opportunities. Um, of course, we don't have, and we don't want to have, the capacity to in, uh, uh, analyze those opportunities in a great deal of depth. Um, and so we need to be able to scan this uh, very efficiently. Um, and so some things are going to be very, very easily discarded just because, you know, uh, they don't fit with our uh, funds uh, investment criteria or uh, it's in an industry that we don't see a lot of potential. Um, and so s some of these may be discarded very, very quickly uh, in one day with one interaction say, okay, sorry, this, this is not for us. Um, some of them will, you know, will take a little bit of a, a, a little bit more time to look into it and understand what, what the company is about, even before doing a very great deal of analysis. Uh, and these checkpoints here are interactions with the company or uh, also uh, formal interactions uh, inside our own organization. So we do weekly uh, meetings in which we review um, the, 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 the deal flow and, and investment opportunities that have been directed to us and try to filter this. Uh, and we know again that we're gonna be wrong many times, most of the times I should say, uh, but we, we, we have the capacity to filter this. So the filter here can be anywhere between one day uh, to a few weeks uh, to say, okay, this is not something that is for us, or actually this is something that it looks interesting and we should spend some time uh, and analyzing. So in our case, what we do is we have one of, in one of those meetings, we we'll get all the investment uh, team together and, and say, okay, look, from these opportunities that came in in the, cost, in the last few weeks, there are these two, three, four, five uh, that we think are really uh, uh, worth uh, looking into, into some depth. And it, that is an important decision because that represents a commitment from our side to, to spend hours uh, and you know, we have a small team. So some uh, uh, part of the, the dedication of that team to go in depth uh, and going in depth can, uh, can mean <clears throat> an effort of uh, many months. So from the point in time where an opportunity starts being formally analyzed and we're talking less than 5% of those many hundreds that came in, uh, then it starts a, a job and a, a, a work stream of looking into these companies into great amount of detail uh, eventually talking to customers, to partners, and getting to know all the team, getting to know the business inside and out. Um, and this is an effort that can take anywhere between two and six months. There are multiple, multiple um, uh, checkpoints in the middle, uh, again, both with the team and internally. And at any point in time, 
we can, you know, if there's a, a red flag that's been identified and say, hey, uh, I'm sorry, we've encountered this, uh, we should stop investing time and hours uh, looking into this opportunity for this and that reason. Uh, we're also, of course, very, very careful to justify the reasons to, to uh, the entrepreneurs, to the founding teams, to say, okay, why we're stopping the analysis if that is the case. Um, uh, but that can happen anywhere uh, uh, during that process. <clears throat> if, if that has not happened, so again, if we've taken the whole effort for several months and now we know the business inside and out. And also an important point here is it's often the case, especially when we talk to, uh, about very, very early stage businesses, and it's certainly the case when we talk about technology transfer uh, investment opportunities, that the business and the investment opportunity that ends up at the end of this process here is very different from what it was at the beginning. Because these interactions that are so much in depth um, may identify things that need to be thought about and corrected uh, and, and redesigned. Um, and based on our input and our interactions, uh, sometimes the company takes the effort to do that. Uh, and that's, of course, a very positive sign if that happens. So we've had cases in which we had you know, lengthy processes here, but in which the product that ends up here is actually much more interesting in the investment proposition than the product that was presented to us here at the beginning of the process. So <clears throat> assuming that the company has gone through this, uh, through, through this process successfully, uh, there's gonna be, again, an internal meeting where we say, yeah, this, this looks a very interesting opportunity. Let's, let's discuss the terms. So let's, make a, let's do a term sheet. Let's put some, some uh, words and language on the table uh, to, to, to define what we think uh, the investment is going to look like. And then that enters into a normal negotiation process up until the closing. And now we're talking a few weeks to the closing. And essentially, I mean, there's very, very little loss between this stage and this final stage of deal closing. So from the point that the deal starts being negotiated, very often it does get uh, close. But this is the funnel that we need to be, uh, that we're talking about and we're looking at. Um, within that, th that two to six months process, what we look at. Uh, so this is the, the way that we sort of organize that thought process. Uh, you know, different investors will have different buckets, but this is the way we look at it. Um, uh, what this means is, uh, first of all, addressable market and opportunity. We need to be very, very clear on what is the market that is being addressed and what is the problem within that market that is being addressed. And very importantly, this is something that is very often over overlooked by the founding teams, and especially at the earlier stages, is how big this can be, the market sizing uh, analysis. Uh, market sizing is a very difficult uh, and complex exercise, but it needs to be really well done. And this is something that is overlooked, and this is something that we normally work with the teams during that two to six months process to define. Um, second part is the innovative value proposition. So we need to be clear uh, understand the technology in a great amount of detail. Uh, you know, we're, we're technologists ourselves, but sometimes it's of course way beyond our comprehension, but we work with specialists uh, that we go in and find in universities to help us in that uh, technology deep dive. Uh, what are exactly are we building and how are we uh, addressing this and what are competing technologies? And sometimes it's not direct competitors that are doing something similar to us, but it's very different solutions to the same problem uh, that we need to, to identify and understand and, and make sure that we believe that we have a, a superior solution. <clears throat> Again, in an, uh, and then an analysis on the maturity, uh, the potential, and what are the risks uh, that are there. So how far along are we in terms of technology and product development? How far along are we into uh, understanding what will be our business model and, and if there's a product market fit? What are the unit economics, you know, the company's business plan, what, what we think is going to be needed in terms of future rounds of financing to, to do this, and what are the main risks here. And then critically, this point number four here, uh, we've learned over time that, of course, is, is, you know, it's almost a cliche, but it, it, it's very, very true. Uh, you know, we need a stellar team to, to, to lead this, and it's preferable to have uh, uh, you know, uh, an okay solution or an okay product with a stellar team 
than to have an outstanding uh, product, but with an average uh, or mediocre team that will not go anywhere for sure. Um, and while the process of these two to six months is looking at, you know, in great detail and now analytically uh, through all these processes here, it's also in the meantime, uh, having a lot of interactions with this team. And at the end of the day is uh, our, our own gut feeling, if you will, okay, this is something that I can trust. Uh, this is a team that I can trust. This is a team that I can work with uh, for the next uh, few years, uh, yes or no. Uh, and you can have, again, stellar marks on all these criteria, but if we're not comfortable with the team, we will not do the investment. And then finally, of course, uh, the more uh, hardcore financial terms of the investment attractiveness, uh, what are the terms of funding round, what are the valuation that, that is justified here, what do we think is going to be the exit for this company, who are we going to sell it to, if it's, that's what we're talking about, uh, and what we expect to, to get uh, out of our uh, returns from this investment. Okay. Um, and you know, I think I have another five minutes just to close this. Um, I'll just go through a very few uh, important tips. I mean, you know, we could spend a whole afternoon talking about this, but I thought I'd, uh, we have different presentations that we give uh, with, with a long list of tips, but I thought I'd summarize a few important ones uh, that we give to entrepreneurs when they want to consider uh, investment from, from venture capital. Uh, and first and foremost is doing the homework. Uh, so the shotgun approach to investors in which sometimes we see that founders do, you know, they do a generic email and send it to uh, you know, a large database of investors, that simply does not work. I mean, our inbox is flooded with, with things like that every day. Um, and so what, what, of course, is key to do is find, for an entrepreneur to do, is to find an investor that is a specialist in that area, that technology area, and even in that investor uh, entity, find a person in the team that is actually uh, has got experience in there uh, that is going to understand what you're doing very quickly. Um, uh, find, out, find out about the portfolio of that investor, uh, similar companies, draw parallels. And if possibly, more, more importantly, if you find a way to be personally introduced, uh, so someone you know who knows that investor and gets personally, personal vouching, that of course can be uh, critically important uh, from, from just getting your foot on the door and having the first conversation. Because again, this is a stage that we're talking of hundreds and hundreds of investment opportunities being directed at every investor. So making sure that you stand out in that first contact is, is of course, uh, critical. Uh, second, assuming that you've got your foot in the door and you're, you started discussions, um, understand the process and ask questions. So understand that if, especially if it's, if it's a fund, the fund has a fiduciary duty to uh, its own investors to, to make the adequate investment decisions. Uh, a fund has its own life cycle, typically 10 to 12 years. Understand where you are in that life cycle. Are you at the beginning of the investment phase, at the end of the investment phase? Because that is critical for the investor to uh, understand, define what, what it's going to look like in terms of uh, 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 timing from investment to exit. And that of course can affect the, 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 the stage that the companies are in at the time of the investment. Uh, understand what is the, the investor's capacity to invest, not only in this round, uh, but in upcoming rounds. Uh, understand what the process looks like. So do you have an investment committee? Uh, who is going to be working in this? So how fast can you uh, work and when can we, when we be looking at the closing? So it's, it's very, uh, it's fine to, to, to ask questions and understand the process and understand where you are and where you sit uh, in that process. Um, and then of course, be prepared some very hard uh, questions and deep analysis. Uh, again, the market sizing, the assumptions that you're making, make sure that you know your competition and be objective about it. That's something that we very often see that, you know, very quickly uh, founders discard the competition as being inferior solutions, but that needs to be very well substantiated. Uh, and then the self self awareness. So again, it's it's okay to ha not have all the answers, and if you're at early stage, you won't have all the answers. But acknowledge those gaps and and uh, work towards uh, towards the, their answer, even together with uh, with the investor. <clears throat> and then finally, uh, make it a relationship, not just a transaction. Again, if you get an investor as a founder or an entrepreneur, you get an investor for from a VC. 
that's that's you know that's going to be a few years of of working together, and uh, it, it better be a, a healthy and pleasant relationship to start with. Uh, so understand the concerns uh, involved, bring your whole team to the table, and you know be conscious of the maths here. Uh, so it's 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 more likely than not, of course, you will be, uh, if, as a founder be rejected uh, as an investment opportunity. But uh, the relationship still stands. So understand when you have a no as a founder uh, making a, a business proposition to an investor, if it's actually a no or not now, uh, and so you keep continuing to discuss because those relationships and the best investments uh, very often get made into companies that we've known for a while, uh, have, were not at the right time when we first looked at them, a character relationship, uh, watch the business evolve, and then uh, later on uh, uh, decide to, to invest in them with, with a great deal of knowledge. So that's what I had to present. Uh, I think I'm more or less on time. I uh, hope you find something uh, in it that is uh, interesting and, and of use to you. Um, and I guess I'm open to questions, right? So that is what we have in the agenda. Thank you, Pedro. Uh, I think it was a very useful and very detailed presentation. Um, we received some questions. Um, first of all, uh, a question um, from, from uh, uh, Marcus from uh, um, Austria. Uh, asking uh, if all countries, uh, all EU countries, are covered on the um, on the uh, on the R fund. Uh, yeah, so our funds, being backed by the IF, is European Union. Okay, so all of the European Union is covered. Outside of European Union, no. Okay, okay. Uh, then I uh, have um, another question from S Sarit from Israel. Um, has there been any investment uh, by in insti institutional bodies? I don't know if this question is clear for you. Uh, it, not, not entirely. So it's in investment into our funds. Okay, so uh, Sarit, can you detail your question? Yeah, so, so she, she did. Yeah, so. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm asking if there were any traditional, uh, institutional bodies entities that uh, invested in the fund in the beginning, in the early stages. No, so, so the only uh, institutional body was, was the IF. Uh, the IF, uh, I think I mentioned, so managing different uh, uh, buckets of money, uh, different yeah. sources of fund. So, and we had the backing of the IF in representation of two uh, uh, buckets, uh, one of them being yes. Enofin and the other one being uh, Portugal Tech, which is the Portuguese uh, fund of funds uh, um, uh, managed by, by the, the IFD, uh, but they've, who has handed the management uh, and the investment decisions onto the IF. So the IF was the sole uh, um, uh, contact point for both of these buckets, uh, but using the two sources of funding. Right, so no local entities, uh, institutional entities from Portugal. Okay, no. I understand. No. Okay, thank no. you. Okay, so uh, now um, uh, I have a question. Uh, uh, Stephen uh, Frigeri from Malta went to uh, raise a question. Um, Stephen? Yeah, if I, if I good, 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 well, good, good morning. I'm just checking the time. Good. Thanks, it was a very interesting presentation. Uh, Actually, was very curious to see, even in terms of the statistics of how Portugal um, has sort of um, churned out quite a number of unicorns. That was a very interesting statistic. I think in terms of like, um, you know, the, of course, the size of the country and and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. it's, it's quite an interesting statistic to see that. Uh, and the reason why I asked this is that um, I think you know when we look at the VC. Uh, investments seen, I mean, it's hard not to compare it to the United States. And when we see the United States, um, I'm always asking myself the question, you know, what is it that the US VC seen? Of course, I mean, they're years in advance ahead of anyone else. The UK is also technically, the UK is also kind of advanced with respect to other parts of Europe mm -hmm. on how the VC scene in the US has probably developed more 
And I think my first question to you is like, I mean, you've, you've proposed uh, within your presentation, you know, your intentions to invest in other parts of Europe. Um, but do you think that there are regulatory issues with regards to investing in other parts of Europe? Um, even in like sourcing funds and creating a VC pot is probably even much harder in Europe than it is maybe compared to the US um, in building a sort of, uh, a, you know, a, a fund in Europe is definitely much more difficult than creating a fund in the US. Um, I, well, I, and I'm just curious to hear what you think about that in terms of like, you know, investing, you know, you've invested quite a lot in Portugal and I guess probably there are a lot of great, you know, um, startups out there in Europe. Um, but maybe there are just issues with regards to, to that. Um, my second question is re with related to, I mean, uh, since we're all from the, well, a lot of us here today are from the EIC fund. Uh, there's a lot of speak about women entrepreneurs. Um, I'm just curious to see how, as a VC, how you are tackling that in terms of gender diversity and uh, inclusivity in terms of, you know, women entrepreneurs as, well, they've proven also to be good investments. I mean, statistically speaking, women investors actually give a better dollar return than men investors. It's, well, there are some statistics in that. Um, and then uh, I'm curious to know like, what your thoughts of, are of the EIC fund in general, actually. It's, uh, it's curious to see, as you know, the European Union now launching the EIC fund. And, um, and yeah, generally speaking, how do VCs see that? From, from your perspective. And thanks again for your presentation. It's really interesting. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. So, so um, starting from the first question and, and against, uh, against the US. So, of course, the US is, is much more advanced and they've, they've practically streamlined uh, very well the, the, uh, the process to set up a fund. And of course, you know, being, uh, having a US fund, uh, they can invest anywhere in the US. Uh, which, which is, of course, very different from, from what happens in, in Europe because we still have to deal with different regulations. Um, uh, but that, that has also meant for the US investors that it's fiercely competitive. Uh, so anytime that there's a, a, an attractive uh, deal uh, to be done in the US, you have you know, all the, uh, uh, the, 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 the more the, the experienced uh, VCs looking into it and wanting to invest. Um, and of course, more often than not, if that's really an attractive deal and you have like the big, uh, well-known names, uh, the, the, the Silicon Valley funds, uh, more likely than not, if you're a small fund, then you probably will not get to make it. Um, and so it creates a little bit that, that problem of adverse selection unless you're one of those big funds. And, and that's been an issue for smaller uh, US uh, VC funds. Um, Europe, of course, is a different scenario in the sense that there's less investment capacity. It's still, at this point in time, uh, a lot more cooperative uh, than it is competitive uh, in the sense that, you know, I gave a few examples, but we always prefer to have co-investors uh, into our fund and very, uh, it's very rare that we find ourselves in a competitive situation in which there are different investors wanting to get into a deal and uh, the founder having the luxury of a broad uh, choice. Uh, so it's, it's still a lot more cooperative than it is competitive. Now, with regards to uh, regulatory hurdles, certainly there are uh, a number uh, uh, in Europe from the fact that we just have different regulations and, and uh, and, and regulatory scenarios and, and, and places, uh, every time someone in Europe sets up a fund, he will have to think uh, if he wants to set up the funds in his own country or in Luxembourg or in Switzerland or in the UK, essentially. Um, just based on the fact that he will want to commercialize that fund and speak to international investors and commercializing a fund across Europe uh, is not something that you can take very lightly because, of course, there's, there's uh, European regulation, there's AIFMD to, to, to handle uh, and to take into consideration. Some progress has been made uh, with the, the UVIC passport and all those, uh, those sorts of initiatives, the uniformity of, of, of regulatory uh, hurdles, but it's still something to take into consideration. Um, and, you know, every time that you, and we ourselves, as we were raising this fund for, 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 for during two years, 
each time we're talking with an investor from a given specific country, you had to go back and check it, uh, how we could commercialize it and be careful that, you know, we cannot uh, overly commercialize uh, invest, uh, an, an investment funds, but we can only do so if there's inbound interest, someone is manifested interest, then we, of course, we're free to speak about our fund and welcome that investor. But the commercialization of the fund itself is, of course, uh, subject to different types of regulatory environments that, that makes it harder to set it up. Once you set up a fund uh, in Europe, uh, it's not too hard to invest in any uh, European country. Uh, so you can more or less freely do so, but uh, there's, there's other types of complications there. Uh, so one example, one of the companies that we've uh, invested in, uh, in this fund, uh, it's actually a company uh, that has headquarters in Berlin, uh, even though most of the company is here in Portugal, in, Port in Porto. So the company was actually created here. All the product teams, so like 80 or 90% of, of the team is here uh, in, in Porto. Uh, but the headquarters are there. And so the investment is being made into a German company in Berlin. And it just so happens that, and our fund is, is, uh, is a, a Portuguese uh, fund, uh, so Portuguese regulated fund. And a Portuguese fund uh, under German law uh, is not recognized as a, an eligible investor uh, just because of the, 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 the formal form that it has, that it has limited partnerships. And so in order to make that investment, we needed to create a subsidiary to the fund. It was just an investment vehicle, so there's nothing in it just to make that investment. Now, of course, this is just unpractical, creates an overhead of management and costs that would be unnecessary, that of course, you know, does not exist in the US uh, at all, uh, and it makes it harder. Um, uh, and so that's, that's the reality that all of the uh, uh, investors uh, throughout Europe have had to deal with. Um, having said that, they have been dealing with it. And, uh, you know, with the benefit of having been around in Portuguese market for so long, we've been, we spent a lot of effort uh, trying to bring international investors into Portuguese companies. And we went through different stages there. We went through a stage where people would say, you know, especially US investors, they would look at us and say, hey, come on, I'm not going to invest in Portugal. Portugal is, is like you know, a third world country to me. I don't, know. I, don't know. I don't even know where it is. So I don't know what the, what the law looks like, how I can trust. So I, I know you guys and I, I like you guys, but you know, I'm not, not going to do that. Um, then we went through a stage of, uh, in which they would actually take the effort of looking into certain portfolio companies of ours and say, hey, that's you know, a very interesting little company that you found there. I'd like to invest, but can they move to their headquarters to the US or to London uh, so that I'm able to invest? And some did, and, and still today, some do when they incorporate, choose to, to put their headquarters uh, abroad. But now... That's, that's been sort of overcome. Uh, and and uh, now we've, we've been able uh, to bring, you know, a few first investors into uh, companies in our portfolio. Uh, and as they become bigger and more well-known names, they're sort of vouch for the local uh, legislation and, and comfortable in doing so. So for example, a couple of years ago, we had an investment into one of our star companies, OutSystems, by Goldman Sachs and KKR, uh, out of their big, both US and, and, and UK based funds that is an investment directly into a Portuguese company. And then that makes it such that all the, the other investors look at it and say, well, oh, okay, if those guys invested in that jurisdiction, then it should be fine to invest in, just in that jurisdiction. So that breaks down the hurdles to do so. Um, and so those, those hurdles, those frontiers have been broken down for, from a more uh, if you will, uh, um, uh, trust uh, and comfort uh, uh, perspective uh, when, when it's time to do the investment. Still, the local laws, the local reg legislations, local regulations are different enough in each country that you need to evaluate how uh, uh, you can do an investment in each country and what you need to do in order to make an investment in each country. Uh, you know, so invest with investment in Spain, or, well, the fund can invest directly. We make an investment in, in Germany, the fund cannot invest directly. We have to create a vehicle. 
and that's 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 painful uh, still you know to realize that in Europe there is still those sorts of differences and those sorts of different interpretations and, and, and demands. Thank you, Pedro. Uh, we are a bit uh, um, late on uh, our schedule, but uh, um, we have uh, one last question, and I ask you for a, a short answer. Uh, is regarding um, is from Jean Luc. How do you look at the EIC accelerator beneficiaries that uh, um, are asking for equity? Uh, do you consider the um, EIC accelerator beneficiaries uh, an interesting um, uh, venture to invest, or they are still too risky? No, not at all. Uh, so, yeah, not at all in terms of being too risky. Uh, you know, we we've we take in a lot of risk, uh, and when we do the investments as early as we do. Um, and so, uh, you know, those stages, those, those types of beneficiaries are not too risky for what we uh, try to do, you know, as long as we see a lot of value and potential in what they're doing, the technology, the, the business potential, etc. Having, of course, um, additional funding and additional uh, uh, eyeballs looking into the company from the EIC accelerator is, is, is also a, a positive. Uh, so we see that as a positive, as, as something that, I like, again, we want, we want to share the risk, we want to share uh, investment opportunities. Uh, more people looking into an, a given opportunity and believing that there's potential in there um, uh, is, is another set of eyes uh, validating uh, our opinion to invest. So there's, there's certainly uh, value to be created from, from the IC Accelerator Investor uh, and we, you know, we look very, very positive for it, of course. Okay. So, Pedro, thank you so much, so much for your very useful uh, presentation. Right now, uh, uh, due to technical problems, uh, Stephen Waki uh, cannot uh, join us. But Alexandre, sorry, Antonio, excuse me. We have a surprise because finally Stefan is here with us. You can see he's with us, so please make okay. him host. And they will, he will present okay. together with uh, Agustin. The, the, okay. the novelties on ESC fund. Uh, and I'd like to thank Pedro also from my side. Thank you, Pedro. Thank you. And I'm sorry I ran over a little bit in, in time. <laughs> thank you. No, no, you were perfect. We started with uh, seven minutes of delay and then questions. So, so uh, uh, Stefan, the floor is yours. Yes, good, good morning. Uh, I'm uh, hesitating to uh, turn on the camera since I have so many problems to connect uh, this morning to the meeting and actually to the previous one as well. So if you don't mind, I will remain, uh, I will remain here without a face today. I don't think, uh, I think most of you already know me. Uh, I don't know if you, you have the presentation that uh, yes. was very sent to you before. Just one moment. Uh, just one moment. Okay. Right. Can you see the um, Stefan Waki presentation? Yeah, yes. I can. I can. Yes. Uh, yes. Okay. So I will. I mean. We will try to. Uh, I will. I will run it with Augustine, that has been uh, doing a lot of the work uh, directly with the beneficiaries and the IB team. So he will take over towards the end of the presentation. I will give you the state of play of where we are on uh, the uh, equity side of the IC accelerator and the due diligence process and what we have learned so far. So you can maybe move the to the next slide. So where are we on the uh, fund? So uh, the commission approved the, the delegation agreement with uh, the EIB, uh, allowing uh, the EIC fund to be created under a new annex of the delegation agreement that was in November 2019. And then since then, we have been discussing with the EIB a number of very important documents that uh, were needed for the actual incorporation of the fund. They were the article of association, the private placement memorandum, and the advisory agreement between the fund and the European Investment Bank that is supposed to act as an investment advisor to the fund. Next one, please. 
this has carried us for a number of months uh, and uh, we have uh, through a very long iterative process of adjusting these documents managed to get the commission to approve this package of documents on the establishment of the fund on the 15th of june and on that basis, then the EIB went ahead and uh, established the fund in Luxembourg the 22nd of June. So the fund has been incorporated. And of course, now that the fund has been incorporated, there's a number of very important uh, steps that needs to take place on which we are working very, very actively these days with uh, the help of the EIB team. If you can go to the next one. So we need to have uh, the inaugural meeting of the board of directors of the fund uh, that should happen still in a couple of weeks uh, and that will allow us to have a number of very important constitutive documents to be approved by the board of directors for the fund to be able to be to function and be operational. And then, of course, in parallel to that, we are uh, also preparing the first batch of investment operation proposals that will need to be submitted to the investment committee in view of, uh, for review, in view of the board of directors uh, to take then a view on, uh, on the recommendations of the investment committee sometime this summer. We still hope to have to be able to hold such a second meeting of the board of directors more on the operational investment decisions by the end of July, but it may be that we can only do it uh, at the end of August or beginning of September, but we are trying to do our best, of course, to try to do it uh, still in July. Next. So, so far we have, as you uh, know, by looking at the results of the, of the cutoffs on which we had blended finance offered, the sense of the October, January, and the March, March cutoffs, we had selected 102 projects the average size of the project was 1.9 million of grants and 3.9 million of equity. And that creates uh, an investment, so equity only, of 400 million euros, close to 400 million euros. Next. So now to look at the process and the governance structure. So, <coughs> sorry. We have made. Um, the fund uh, is a bit of a particular, sorry, animal, since um, the fund uh, is uh, at this stage an empty structure that uh, is entirely animated by a number of uh, two governance bodies, which are the board of directors and the investment committee, and a number of contracts, external contracts with a number of service providers. Of course, the most important of these uh, service contracts is the one we have with the investment advisor, which is done by the European Investment Bank for us, as per the delegation agreements um, between uh, the Commission and the EIB. But we have an, another uh, set of third-party service providers, uh, the administrative agent, depository, auditor, insurance, and so on. All these uh, third-party service providers are directly contracted by uh, the uh, EIC fund and uh, this, of course, these contracts have been prepared and the selection of the service providers has been prepared by the EIB for us. But uh, this is a very important element because uh, otherwise the fund will not be able, of course, to function. It needs uh, these different service providers to, uh, to be there. But of course, if we look at the operational uh, core of the fund, uh, the investment advisor, so the EIB team is uh, getting the files as soon as the evaluation is over and then uh, starting up a process of due diligence by contacting the company, sending out a questionnaire uh, and then interacting individually with the company in parallel to, of course, the grant preparation process that is taking place in parallel to that. And once uh, the uh, EIB has reached uh, enough, I would say, uh, finality on this process, it drafts an investment recommendation that then is submitted to uh, the investment committee. The investment committee reviews it and then uh, expresses an opinion which could be approval, which could be uh, rejection, which could be uh, amendment. Um, so there is a variety of position that the investment committee can take and then it forwards uh, the recommendation either in an amended form or uh, in an approved form 
to the board of directors for approval. So the board of directors need to then give its approval to what the investment committee has reviewed and approved. And, and then on that basis, if, uh, for example, an investment decision has been agreed, then on that basis, it goes back to the uh, investment advisor, to the EIB team, to complete the process with the signing of the equity agreement, of the investment agreement with uh, the beneficiary. So that process is where we would like to be uh, sometime over the summer in order to have the first equity agreements uh, on the first cut off companies that have been selected uh, at the end of last year. Next. So the AIC fund board of directors uh, is, is the main decision body of the, of the fund. I mean, it makes all the decisions, actually. Uh, it's composed of five members, two of them being uh, commission officials, given the nature of, uh, of, the, of the fund. Uh, there are three independent members, uh, two that are, I would say, a limited uh, portfolio that is more, I would say, of a technical nature and not an operational nature. Uh, and then we have uh, the EIC uh, Fund Investment Committee, which actually is the body that will do most of the work in the name of the fund, preparing uh, basically the decision of the Board of Directors. Uh, so it will make all the proposals to, uh, to, the, to the board. It's composed of seven independent experts and one commission officials that will formally chair those meetings uh, but uh, we will refrain from taking a view on the, of the decision itself. It's purely in order to animate the, the discussions of the independent experts. Uh, the process of appointment of these uh, investment uh, committee members, like uh, the fund board of directors, is uh, so for the fund board of directors, it is uh, completed upon the incorporation of the fund. It will be completed for the investment committee once the first board meeting takes place, which uh, should be, like I said, in about two weeks. And there, on that basis, the investment committee will be fully constituted and will be able to then operationally start to process the investment recommendation that will be forwarded by the uh, European Investment Bank. And then, uh, of course, the investment advisor role, which is uh, quite key in the whole structure that we have in mind here. Uh, so it will uh, be, I would say, the key uh, implementing arm, actually, of the, of the IC fund and assist both the board and the investment committee in the execution of investments by identifying with the beneficiary the appropriate financing structures, by negotiating the investment terms, by also uh, developing the matchmaking potentially with co-investors, but also uh, liaising with existing investors in case they do exist and uh, with the company in order to make sure that uh, we do have a smooth process of the entry of the EIC fund as an investor into the equity of the beneficiaries. And then finally, negotiates and close, uh, closes the final investment agreement, the shareholder agreement. Next, please. Okay, that you uh, you already know. So, I mean, in the case of blended finance option, we have a due diligence and an equity investment. Next. So, the due diligence is performed uh, by the IC fund. I mean, in, in this case, I mean, it's uh, performed by the IB as the advisor, huh? as the investment advisor. When we, when we say the IC fund, it means basically the structure of the IC fund that, uh, like I said, uh, per this invest investment advisory agreement, the EIB team will, uh, will accomplish those tasks in the name of the fund. So, I mean, towards the outside, the EIB team doesn't act as the EIB. Huh? It acts as the EIC fund, but I mean, for all purposes and uh, of their work, uh, of course, it is, it is a European investment bank uh, team that is doing this job. Uh, it will define, of course, uh, tailor-made investment uh, terms that will be fitting the situation of the company and the project needs as they are being reflected in the application. And uh, the IB has put together a questionnaire that has been sent, uh, that is being sent to the beneficiary. And uh, the questionnaire is slightly customized according to the information already provided by the beneficiary in the proposal in order to make it more relevant to what we see. Next, please. So uh, during that stage, we focus on a number of compliance issues, the statutes, bylaws, financial reports, ownership structures, the general information, 
uh, that is provided on the company, uh, how it's organized, uh, whether other DDs were actually due diligence were actually carried out, whether uh, rent, rent, uh, venture capital funds had been contacted before, were in contact with the companies, who has been acting as consultants to the companies, uh, for example, often in the applications to the IC accelerator. And then it would look also at the financials, the business plan, uh, the balance sheet, cash flows, uh, the plan for capital expenditure, working capital, and so on. Uh, and of course, quite importantly, the ownership structures, the management, and the corporate governance. Uh, an important element, of course, is the intellectual, intellectual property, uh, the licensing agreements, the freedom to operate, and so on. And then there's a number of uh, legal issues that often are, um, I would say, country sensitive, member state sensitive in particular. Uh, authorization to operate, ongoing litigation, breaches, and so on, but also wh what are the possibilities that are being offered by the regulatory framework of the different countries, which of course is an important element that we need to, uh, to keep in mind. Next one, please. So what uh, we can report at this particular stage of the operating activity in this basically the shadow period in which the EIB basically has worked uh, for the IC fund without being uh, without the IC fund being incorporated and without therefore the investment advisory agreement to be fully in place. So the EIB has basically uh, advanced its work for us in in that period of time as we were working on the incorporation. Uh, and uh, so on the first cutoff, uh, so the, the cutoff of the 19th of October 2018, that uh, was uh, actually the evaluation was publish publicized, I think, at the beginning of December 2019. 35 proposals of blended finance were selected with 128 million of investment in equity. 100% have been contacted by the AB team. 100% of the due diligence questionnaires have been sent. The term sheets. Uh, have been already drafted and sent to the IC fund. Some of them have been already agreed with the target company. So on that basis, we believe that for those where there is already preliminary agreement, the conclusion of the equity agreement, once the investment committee takes a view and uh, the board of directors confirms, that view should be uh, relatively fast. And we hope it will st still take place uh, over the summer. On the second cutoff, uh, which uh, closed on the 8th of January 2021, uh, 2020, there were 21 proposals selected, of which about 97 million investment foreseen. Here, 100% of the companies have been uh, contacted and the due diligence have been uh, sent out. I think here we are less advanced. I mean, we, we can ask the uh, colleagues of the IB that are actually here afterwards to whether they can tell us where Precisely, we are on that, but I think on some of them, uh, progress has been made already on the term sheet, but I don't think that this is a general uh, situation. And finally, on the third cutoff that finished on the 20, uh, 28th of March uh, 2020, with, as you remember, a COVID and a non-COVID part, 46 proposal, 23 COVID, 23 non-COVID selected for a total of 174 million potential investment. And here, of course, uh, we are at the beginning. Next, please. So the matchmaking, uh, which is an important feature of the EIC fund, is something that is still uh, in development. It is something that we are, uh, we have been approached already, and we are in contact with a number of VCs and investors that have either approached us or that we have contacted uh, ourselves directly on on number of requests. Uh, some of them coming from uh, committee members and so on. Uh, of course, the, this process is a bit complicated at the beginning because, uh, first of all, the fund was not established and therefore it was difficult for the IB team to establish such a contact directly with other investors to act in the name of the fund without having a backing of an agreement. So the situation now will, uh, will be uh, a bit different and therefore we can move uh, much more uh, quickly now and much more operationally in the contact with potential investors. We have a number of leads. I'm not going to uh, disclose which they are uh, in terms of, uh, of uh, concrete cases and concrete companies. Uh, but of course, uh, the, the pilot phase is also a way for it to test and, uh, and to establish, I would say, uh, a protocol or a, a system 
a process that will allow us to tap into the resources of uh, communities of VCs that we are trying to, um, to create. Uh, the idea, of course, is that they could potentially replace the fund or at least co-invest alongside the fund, which is, I think, the most likely uh, operation, or provide a number of, uh, of support to the companies in case they are not ready to put down money at this particular stage. And then, uh, if you go to the next slides, uh, something that we have, I think, yes, next, yes. Something that we have already explained on many different occasions, the system of the so-called buckets, uh, where we test the market interest in case there is no market interest. Uh, well, I mean, obviously the IC fund will perform the due diligence and structure its investment and uh, then deploy a number of uh, business acceleration services, including mentoring, which is an important element, and uh, will decide whether it will use an equity or quasi-equity instrument for, for um, uh, effecting this investment. Uh, but basically, it will be done by the IC fund from the beginning to the end. And that uh, normally should apply, I would say, to the, I would say the easiest cases that don't have, don't uh, provoke, I would say, any interest from market participants. On the, the second, on, uh, we are basically in the same situation as bucket two, but there is some kind of an, in, of an interest that then we need to see how that option could be exercised. We are reflecting how the best way it is for um, investors that are not ready to put down money yet, but that would like to be kept informed on how the company is involving, how we can, um, uh, in effect, uh, ensure that they, they have the option of looking at these companies at a, at a given time later. Then in bucket three, so next uh, slide, please. This is probably where we will have, I would say, uh, uh, the most activity coming from uh, partners, which is where uh, there is mark partial market interest. So we find a co-investor that is really to co-invest with us, amount being, of course, different uh, depending on the company. And then in that case, and this is the important change, the due diligence will be performed by the potential co-investor or co-investors. Uh, and then, of course, we'll do that in, with the agreement of the beneficiary in order to negotiate the terms with the potential co-investors. And we will, of course, uh, advise uh, the company on, on the uh, possibilities that are being offered by these co-investment opportunities. And then in bucket four, we, we are in the situation in which uh, we have so many uh, or so much money actually being targeted at the company that it doesn't really make sense for the IC fund to uh, take its stake as it was foreseen in the evaluation. And there we believe it is uh, simpler for just for us to back out and let the private sector to, uh, to operate. That in bucket four, I just would like to clarify, of course, the grant will continue to exist and will continue to be implemented. And actually, in certain cases, this is actually the reason why, of course, there is now market interest that can replace the IC fund in investing. Um, uh, into uh, into the company. Next, please. And now we will go into, uh, I would say, the first feedback uh, that we got on, on the experience of the first cut-off. Uh, and then I will give the floor briefly to Augustine to highlight on a number of, of cases uh, what we have done you know, in order to implement, uh, to start implementing this equity investment. So on the, fir on the 35 proposals of October 2019, uh, first of all, the general cases has been the, there has been no external uh, investors already among the shareholders. And in most cases, the, um, therefore, the IC fund is to invest alone. And so therefore, here on, uh, we have verified basically the EIC accelerator premise that the level of risk is considered to be too high by potential investors to be present in the company. Uh, and therefore, uh, the, we have proceeded, the IB has proceeded with the due diligence alone there without the participation of co-investors uh, at this stage. And 10 to 15 operations are already far advanced in which the recommendations are ready for the investment committee to be looked at uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, of these 10 to 15 cases that have been looked at in detail by uh, the bank, uh, 50 are to be done through equity type. Uh, through convertible notes um, in which the IC uh, or another 50% in which the IC will either co-invest or will take equity position alone being the investment uh, very low. And now if we move to uh, the next slide, I think this is already on the basis uh, of that. Uh, 
uh, we had a number of uh, interaction with the executive agency, the beneficiaries and the IB team during these past few months that we are now going to summarize in a number of cases. I would like to say, of course, that the pandemic and the, the appearance of the coronavirus in Europe since uh, February, March has impacted quite significantly the situation for many companies that we had selected and in their investment plans, at least in their timing, if not uh, the, I would say the actual amounts and, uh, and substance of it. And of course, that need to be uh, taken into account and will be definitely further assessed in view of the recommendations that will be provided to us by the investment advisor, by the IB team. And now I give the floor, I think, to uh, Augustine for going more into the details of the type of issues that we had to deal with during these past few months. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, I mean, can you also see me? Because I don't see myself, but in any case, I will continue. If you could yes, go ahead. We can see you. We can see you. Okay, fine, excellent. So, could you go ahead to the next uh, slide? Uh, the next slide, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, as Stefan was mentioning, I mean, we have seen uh, the first uh, 35 from the first cutoff uh, are already in, in a very advanced stage. Also, some of the second cutoff. And certainly, there we have seen many different things. Uh, so, it, one thing was, was already certain for us, but is confirmed now is that every case is different. So we see, as Esteban has mentioned, cases where the companies have come already with the potential investors, potential co-investors, uh, very interesting cases, cases in which uh, in the end is going to be the EAC fund, the one which invested on. Here, what I'm going to, to explain is a number of examples of issues which uh, were particularly interesting and challenging because uh, here the, the novelty of the blended finance is that we are providing, as you have understood, uh, uh, is, a, is a financial instrument, which is a combination of a grant component and an equity component. Of course, that means that uh, for any operation to be able to, to be in the end approved and go ahead needs to comply to, the, to all the requirements regarding the, the grant and all the requirements regarding the equity component, even in terms of eligibility, which is, the, is like the entry point. Now, the question is that uh, that required to have a very good coordination between the agency, EASME, which is doing the, the grant preparation, and the EIB, in terms of the, who is undertaking the, the due diligence, in order to ensure that, uh, that we would move with the, together in a coordinated matter in order to support these projects and solving issues. All the issues that we have had that I'm going to illustrate here have been solved. They were relatively easy, but of course they, they, they created some challenges. The first one is the grant with consent. This is something that uh, it was obvious for us uh, since the first cutoff that uh, some of the companies which have applied and put the tick to grant with consent, so they have given their consent uh, because they request a grant, but they say, okay, in some cases, if the jury considers that some equity is necessary because of two reasons, basically, because some of the activities are uh, in TRL9 and therefore they cannot be supported by a grant, or because the jury considers that uh, uh, it is very important for the company to be able to scale up very fast to receive um, an equity injection, and because they see that uh, in, in the plan that has been submitted by the company, it is not clear from where they are going to get some the, the necessary financing to continue with the scale up after the end of the technology development. So in those cases, uh, this is the reason why the grant with consent is there as an opportunity. But some companies did not understand very well, they just did it probably to ensure that they, that they could uh, uh, be, go ahead without any, any problem. And now when they went to the, to the actually the jury interview, uh, the question, they had already given the consent, so it was possible for the jury to do that, and in, in, since the first cutoff, in I would say in all cases, the question was asked to them during the interview, uh, you have put a grant with consent, so you give your agreement, yes, we give our agreement. But then in, in a, just a couple of or three cases, once uh, they were selected the companies, they came back saying, okay, but we are not very certain about the fact of receiving the, the equity. So we've tried, first of all, to understand what was the reason for that. And basically, in, in most cases, it was the same thing that the founders uh, who were already quite dilute, diluted in the, in the company at that stage, they were very concerned that they would be heavily diluted by the entry of the AC fund. 
uh, and they, do, they did not understand, in addition, the investment strategy of the fund, in particular being founders friendly, patient capital investor, etc. So it was just a matter of explaining to them what was the, the, the investment strategy, what were the modalities for entering into, into different projects, and most likely into their project, because it would be everything would be undertaken most likely in those specific cases through a convertible note. So no valuation and no dilution at that stage. It would be postponed at a later stage for the next event, the next round of capital increase, most likely. So in that case, it was all, but it was very clear. It was made very clear to them that once they are selected for blended finance, it is not that they can pick the equity or the grant. Uh, no, it is, it is a financial instrument which has two components which go together. So in case a company doesn't want to have the equity, of course, it will not receive the grant otherwise and vice versa. So that was the, the, the second one. Yeah, please go ahead. The second one is, was something that uh, perhaps we didn't expect, but of course, once it happened, we saw that they were going, it was likely that we would have new cases, and certainly we have had several, and we don't expect even more. So uh, from the first cutoff, uh, between the first cutoff and the second cutoff, if you remember well, the Brexit agreement was finally uh, uh, adopted. And the, uh, there's a transitional, in the transitional agreement, the, it, it indicated that uh, during one year, uh, UK companies can still receive grant-only support. So it's, it's in general, it's not only for the EIC, it's for the whole, the whole uh, commission uh, uh, instrument, but not financial instruments. Financial instruments, they are not possible any longer during the transitional period of one year. Now, this creates the problem of, uh, of course, if it's a grant only, there's no problem. Uh, of course, those companies which uh, had perhaps requested or were prepared for blended finance, that is not possible. It, uh, it's only possible grant. The question was the issue of, uh, of uh, well, what happens with grant with consent. Now, here the case was the case of a number of companies there was one in, which created a, this sort of doctrine which had already a, a subsidiary in a member state and perhaps to make sure in, in the context that they, in the future would nothing go wrong in case there was going to be Brexit, they made the application through this subsidiary. But this subsidiary actually was basically a, just a sort of office, a sale office. Uh, all the activity in terms of innovation, IP, all the management, everything, it was clear when we started the due diligence that was remaining in the in the UK. Of course, that was creating a problem because it was for blended finance, financial instrument. It is not a. It was very clear even that part of the grant was going to be used uh, by the company in the by the UK company, not the totality. Uh, and then basically, what we said is, listen, here is something that when it is the case of a company that uh, is planning because of Brexit to keep the internal market at the, at, as their first market. So they are planning to move to the, to the European Union, to one of the member states, because they want to have a, a greater market. That is something which is possible. But of course, it's clear that we need to see that the, that the company is, is already moving, has a clear plan to move, and it has to move. Because from the perspective of equity investment, it's important that most of the value we invest where most of the value of the company is. So it is clear that if they have this subsidiary in one member state, they move the IP rights, uh, part of the management, uh, the future growth is there, the future. So it is a movement from the comp of the company from the UK to, the, to that the subsidiary. Now, in the meantime, in this particular case, but it's something that we have seen in others, it is possible, for example, for the grant component that part of it, that the majority of it, it is used in the subsidiary in this member state, and part of it can still be used, but it should be a minority by the UK and that still mother company, but acting as a third party, so what we say, third party and a minority of the world. But the equity component, we are going to make the investment in the subsidiary because we assume that the growth is going to be in the future there. So the UK company, every time is going to, its, its, its position is going to be perhaps one of a pure holding company in the future, but, uh, but most of the activities, most of the growth, most of, the, of, the, of what is the value of the company, is in a company in the European Union. Uh, and there we came up, if you could go to the next slide with a number, I think it's there, if I remember well. Okay, yeah. It's a number of things that, uh, that we mentioned to the company that we were, we, we were seeking to see in that company uh, a planning that they are actually going, moving to the European Union. Uh, transfer the business critical assets. That doesn't mean that it has to be immediately. Of course, these things, is always a process. 
and, the, and many companies really are moving to the EU because they want to keep a larger, for example, in the, in the renewable energy area, they, they want to keep a larger internal market in which to grow and afterwards go uh, and grow uh, globally. But they need a large market, larger than the UK. So to transfer the business critical assets, including all the IP to the EU company, relocate the headquarters to the EU, is something that they need to do. Uh, transform the UK company. This is one possibility in an SPV of the current investments, a sort of holding uh, with just the, uh, that role of a holding, not, the, not having the operations. The operations should move to the EU, run a substantial parts of the operation from the EU company, relocate management, future subsidiaries, as uh, you can see, receive the potential EAC equity investment, of course, in the EU company, not in the UK, and then perform, this is very important, perform the next equity rounds in the EU company. So the EU company is the one which is going to grow in the future. Well, that was one case which happened, and we have seen that there are others. There were others in the last cutoff, in the previous one, and uh, I've seen others which are already in the pipeline. So it's something that we have uh, learned with this. If you could go ahead to the next uh, case. This is a, an issue raised because of the fact that, uh, of course, some of the companies that uh, have applied to the, to the EAC accelerator, uh, they were already in contact or with a number or, or perhaps at the same time in parallel were in contact with a number of, of uh, investors in other countries and this particular case with US investors. There are two cases. I will go very uh, quite fast. The first one was an issue that the, uh, you know very well those who, who are operating in this area that the, uh, sometimes US uh, VC when the company is relatively young uh, is a startup what they say is okay okay we are ready to invest in, in your company but we would like you to relocate uh, to, to the US, which means that uh, even though some of the operations can be maintained in Europe, uh, the idea is to relocate the, in particular the, the main value, so IP rights, etc., and future growth to the US. Of course, we mentioned to, the, to that company, well, let me mention just before, in the case before, it was also so, that the one of the UK, that the company accepted all those conditions and decided to move to the EU. Now, in this particular case, we mentioned that to the company, say, listen, it is not possible for us uh, to give the grant to a company which is just a small portion of what we receive because the, most of the companies move into the US and most of the value. And it is the same thing regarding the equity. We cannot invest in something which is going to become just a small subsidiary. We need to invest equity uh, because, of course, although for the EIC fund, uh, the uh, return is not the most important return on investment. It's not the most important driver. Of course, it's important as well. So we need to invest in in where value is going to be. Uh, so we explained this to the company and this matter was solved as well. They decided to stay here. The, the venture capital could be a, a co-investor now or later, but of course with no obligation to relocate. So that was easy to solve as well. Uh, is this, it is explained here. I can go ahead, but it's the same thing as, as I mentioned already. If we could go ahead to the next one, the next slide. Here, uh, sorry, the, the following one. This one I forgot it, exactly this one. This was a, a, a different case in which it was clear that most of the operations, no, most of the operations, I would say all the operations, all the value, uh, all the growth in terms of, uh, of economic growth, in terms of job creation was going to stay here. But this company had already started, probably at the time of sending the application to the ACU or a bit earlier, to, it was in need of raising capital and they had already contacted a number of investors in the US and there, for the purpose, for the only purpose of, of uh, raising finance there, they created a holding company. A holding company in the US, which is Holt, the, 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 the company which is in the EU. And all the value, all the growth, future growth, et cetera. Okay, all the value, all the operation, all the, all the job creation, et cetera, was going to be initially in Europe, of course. We want to support companies that afterwards grow and uh, become global actors. Now here the question was different because certainly when we uh, were conceiving the AC fund at the beginning we think about the most common cases and there I say okay we are going to invest the equity in EU companies but now from the perspective of precisely putting it where the future upside of the company, the future growth in terms of the value of the company is going to stay, it was going to be in this holding company in, in, a, in a US members, in a US state, in, their, in Delaware which is quite quite common. And then we examine it internally and say, okay, for as long as certainly what is the, the growth of the company, the operation, the jobs are being created here in Europe, the very fact that the, 
that the, the holding is in the US, that doesn't prevent us from investing in the holding, although it's been in the US, because the impact is going to be here, because the, it is precisely in that holding where the, the upside afterwards is going to be, which will allow us in case of success to participate in, the, in that upside and the return on investment. If we could go to the next slide, please. Okay, so it's the end of it. Uh, thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Stefan and Augustine. Um, we are uh, about uh, 20 minutes late, um, but we, are, uh, we will have room for uh, some questions. Um, we, uh, we have a question from Marcos from uh, Austria um, regarding the EIC fund governance. Uh, the, what do you mean uh, the third part service and the, um, what does a depository actually do? What is it for? Can you hear me? Stefan is there still? Okay, I'm going to move. Yes, I'm here, yeah. Did you uh, listen to the, the, the question? What the uh, depository actually do on the um, EIC fund governance? I can't yeah, okay. yeah. yeah, no, this is a, you know, any fund has a, <clears throat> there's what is the financing activity and it is done is what we, what has been described by Stefan with that we are doing together with the with the EIB as our investment advisor but around that there are a number of service providers which have to provide a number of services insurance auditing uh, the administration of everything uh, and there's one entity that we have uh, following a market assessment that we have uh, uh, prepared the contract that is going to be signed in the first meeting of the board which is the administrative and depository depository basically is having uh, all the safekeeping, all the investments that we are doing, usually is being done together. But these are services providers which are working with us, ancillary service to the main activity, which is being sure that we, I mean, that we are investing in the companies and we are providing the best, uh, the best uh, financing structure to support the company. Those are, this is common in all the different funds. And there are a number of companies specialized in providing those services. We contacted through the EIB auspices a, a number of them and following a process, we selected Alter Domus is our service provider in Luxembourg. Okay, thank you. Then uh, we have two short questions regarding uh, from Chris and from Marcos um, also. Um, can we have an example of uh, uh, this EIB questionnaire? And uh, at the same time, um, can you, um, it is possible to have uh, an example or, or a preliminary term sheet? Yeah, uh, this the, the due diligence questionnaire for you to understand the, the is, is what uh, once, once the company has been selected after the process, uh, the EIB starts the first contact and then say, Les, we are going to send you a, a questionnaire, which is quite standard. That I need to check with the EIB because it's the, they have their own their own questionnaire, I'm sure that other VCs, they have their own model. So it's something that they need to check. I cannot say yes or not at this stage. And regarding the term sheet, uh, there's no, because we have uh, been asked that question many times, Do you, could you send us the, the, what is the standard term sheet? The problem is that in this case, what I learned already after, after the first case is that there's no such thing as a standard. Uh, of course, there's a term sheet. The term sheet is something that uh, following the due diligence, uh, when, uh, when we go to the stage of submitting the recommendation from the IEB as investment advisor to the investment committee. There's of course the document which explains the outcome of the due diligence together with the term sheet. The term sheet is like a, a number of bullet points on different issues, which is what is the amount which is going to be invested, in which form is going to be invested, whether there are tranches or not, whether there are important issues from the point of view of investor, for example, that we are tagging along on, on the uh, devaluation of other co-investors, whether uh, there's going to be, for example, a board position. So a number of things that are, I wouldn't think that, I would think that it is possible to just eliminate all the content of any of them, a simplified form, just as an example. But it is an example which is not, a, is, is completely common. Is the, and this term sheet is important because one it is, once it is a, a confirmed by the investment committee and then approved by the board of directors in the first meeting as uh, Stefan was doing, we are trying to do it uh, well, 
between uh, July and, and August, let's put it like that. Uh, that is what it goes to our law firms that are going to prepare towards the investment contract. The investment contract takes all those elements which are in the term sheet and develop in the form of, a, of a, the usual uh, investment agreement which is signed between the, in this case, between the board of the EIC fund and the company. So I, I, I believe that, the, that the, regarding the term sheet, by eliminating things in the end, it will be just probably half a page, can give an, an, an impression. I think it would be possible. On the other one, I need to ask the EIB because of course they are their proprietary, uh, uh, this is something which is the proprietary uh, the ownership and I need to, be, to ensure. But otherwise, perhaps we can give an impression of the things which are, is the usual questions that would be asked uh, for anyone making an investment into a company. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Then uh, we have a, a question from Christina. Um, do, do you mention that uh, um, the EIC fund already have uh, agreements with uh, VCs? Uh, um, we understand no, that. No, no, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. So, I mean, let me clarify on this. We don't have agreements. We have a number of interests from VCs, investors. Those have not led to agreements of any sort between the EIC fund and those VCs. And, uh, and therefore, I'm not able to tell you from which countries they come because we don't have such agreements in the first place. Okay. Then on the next question on the buckets uh, that I can see, well, like I said, I think most of the, of the, of the deals, uh, of the 102 uh, companies being selected will be in bucket one, uh, in which we will conclude an EIC equity participation without the participation of other investors. And uh, if there is indeed participation of other investors, it would be under bucket three, not replacement of the EIC, but co-investment. So I would say bucket one and bucket three, but I think the proportion here will be probably, I mean, we can ask the colleagues of the bank, but probably something like nine to one huh, in, the, in the first instance. Uh, is the former EIC VC community a formal relationship or a loose community? We are setting it up. Uh, it's um, it's uh, based on the willingness on the basis of the investors to participate on a case-by-case -case basis. So there will be no obligation on the part of the investors participating in uh, the VC community we're trying to create in order uh, to basically take actively or uh, participate actively in one of the buckets. I mean... Uh, we are just going to create a platform in which we will ask some investors to register. And of course, if that leads to certain deals on the basis of their interest, fine. If it doesn't, it doesn't. I mean, uh, there, there is no obligation here in order to be part of this community that they need to be, uh, to be active in the sense of taking, uh, 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 I would say, an active uh, ownership or an active investor role into that. Convertible instruments, are there other convertible instruments that use apart from convertible loans? Well, we can ask the ID if they have such, uh, such uh, convertible instruments in mind. Under which the US scenarios, I mean, I guess from the presentation of Augustine, under which of the US scenarios the project will have to be terminated? Maybe Augustine, you want to come in on that one? Sorry, could you repeat the question? Because I cannot read it here, let me see. And under which of the U.S. scenarios the project will have to be terminated? So maybe we can clarify under which situation with the U.S. investors we would have to terminate the investment. Okay. Well, in, in both cases, uh, there was no need to terminate because the company understood and, and we... So the first, probably the second one is not, is not a, even a question because, because we, we decided that we could invest in the holding. So it was respected what, the, what was... The, the concern and the request of the company. On the other one, the first one, in which the, the VC investor had requested the company to move to the US, of course, that would be a situation under which if the company says, yes, yes, of course, I moved to the US because for whatever reason, because perhaps the US market is much more important than the EU market and I, I'm going to do my growth there, etc. If they move to the US, the most of the value of the company and, and just staying with the subscription in Europe, in that case, yes, of course. The, the blended finance will not be able to take place. The totality of it, as we mentioned before, the grant component and the, and the equity component, which go together. Thank you. Finally, one last question. What is the typical maturity of the EIC convertible um, uh, bonds? Convertible note. Notes, yes. Uh, it depends. The, the convertible note is, a, is something, it's an instrument that depends on each jurisdiction. So, related to the previous question, it is possible that in one jurisdiction some things are possible and in other jurisdictions it are not possible. So we'll only know that as we are 
uh, uh, addressing each case. That is the, but the convertible or not, what it allows is to, to make uh, the injection of the investment takes place, depending on the jurisdiction appears in the balance sheet of the company or not, as that. But uh, it is something which we postpone valuation and, and actually the, the entry into the capital proper of the company to a future event, which most likely is the next round of capital increase. So it depends on when the next round of capital increase is foreseen. Okay, one very last question, and, and my apologies is Fabrizio, we are um, a bit late, but what, uh, what, if, uh, what if after the investment in the US holding, the company still moves to the US? No, that's why, that's why I mentioned before that each case is different. So everything, no, certainly in those cases, not only in those, in other cases that we have examined, we impose conditions. Those conditions are part of the investment, of the investment agreement. And certainly that would be a condition in this particular case, certainly. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, right now, we'll give the floor to uh, Fabrizio from the European Investment Bank that will uh, share his, his vision as the um, advisory uh, body of the EIC um, fund. F Fabrizio, are you there? Yes, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's Fabrizio Morgera. Uh, um, thanks for the invitation. Uh, um, I don't know if you are able to see the, my screenshot. Yes. Okay. Uh, well, um, I'm Fabrizio Mogella. I'm Senior Investment Officer for EAB. I'm in the task force working for uh, ESC Fund. Uh, basically, uh, the European Commission colleagues already provided some uh, information about the current uh, activity of the ESC Fund. So, these slides already was incorporated in the European Commission Fund. Uh, European Commission presentation. This is just a snapshot to show you, for example, the the um, composition by sector and by country on the first call. As you may see, um, uh, the, the the startups are uh, deep tech startups. So, in fact. Uh, 70% of the companies are uh, in the information technology health engineering sector and uh, in, uh, as a um, uh, in terms of uh, sector uh, in terms of sorry of, of countries uh, as you may see uh, the portfolio of the first call is quite diversified we are talking about only about blended uh, financing so uh, we are not talking also about grant only uh, financing and um, i we point out some issue that we faced during the first call, but which were already highlighted by the European Commission colleagues. So I, to save time, I will go to the second call. The second call, uh, we are slightly behind in terms of uh, uh, work because of course we started later. Uh, the first call started in November, so we were able to uh, put already some uh, draft term sheet uh, in place and uh, informally uh, agreed with the with the companies. While on the second call, uh, uh, we sent out all the diligence questionnaires, but uh, most of them they have to uh, come back uh, fulfilled. However, the, as you may see by country, uh, the same. So the information technology health engineer represents 70% of the total these approved, and uh, in terms of uh, geographic geography diversification more or less uh, is the same uh, in the second call maybe Spain France uh, and uh, Germany accounted for uh, 55 percent but uh, uh, in the third call uh, we already know that, that there is a, uh, more uh, geography geography diversification um, you ask some question about uh, uh, the term sheet uh, we provided the two example of term sheets um, uh, as the European Commission colleagues say that we we can enter uh, both as equity as a convertible notes and these are more or less the the, the main terms that we are negotiating with the uh, the, the clients um, let's say we, we try to to give uh, ESC fund uh, um, uh, governance, uh, good governance in the portfolio companies in order to avoid, uh, as uh, also Augustine said, uh, possible shift of IPs to uh, uh, USA, for example. So in that case, uh, we need to set up a governance within the portfolio company where the ESC fund has, uh, for example, veto rights. This is something with, that we need to still agree uh, in, in internally with the ESC fund because it has been established only uh, this week, but uh, however, uh, we already uh, agreed, for example, this uh, 
10 sheet informally with the with the client uh, for example uh, in that case we have uh, the a 4.5 million uh, investment uh, split in tranches uh, this is the the, the the approach that we would like to follow uh, of course, it depends of also the commitment, the capital already raised by the company, because if a company raised already, for example, 50 million uh, in equity or by grant, and uh, they are asking for 5 million, we try to, to put the, the, the 5 million uh, uh, up front, because the company has raised uh, 50 million. Uh, in case the company has not raised anything, uh, because it's early stage, of course, in that case, we try to, to go for convertible notes in order to to have a third party valuation in the incoming round, equity round. And in that case, we split the tranche. And uh, usually the second, the third tranche is subject to also to some milestone to be defined with the client and in agreement, of course, with the AC fund. Um, yeah, this is the, the, the first example. The second example was a 50 million. Uh, uh, you see uh, here, for example, round and then convertible notes uh, of five million, subject to uh, condition precedent. Um, for example, in that case, 15 million will finance uh, an investment plan of 85 million. So the additional uh, financing will come maybe for from other investors or from other uh, source of financing like grants or maybe the cash flows uh, in. Uh, in the coming years. And um, as a standard clauses, we do, would like to adhere to the shareholder agreement if it's already in place, or we want to like to set up a shareholder agreement. And uh, standard uh, governance rights uh, at board of directors level, also a shareholders meetings level. So uh, we would like to act as a normal uh, VC fund. Uh, I would stop the presentation here. I open to, to questions. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Fabrizio. I think we um, were waiting for some questions. The, does you have some questions regarding the uh, EIB presentation? Well, we still have 10 minutes, so we are on our uh, schedule right now. Okay, I think this this has been um, a long um, webinar. So, uh, if uh, uh, there is no other questions, I think we, we um, okay, should close this this webinar. Uh, I think uh, um, it is a, a success having uh, four million euros uh, on the um, EIC fund pipeline. So, uh, I hope this this event. Um, um, uh, was useful for you. These uh, insights, the, the first learnings from the EIC investment are very important, not only for the uh, October uh, cutoff, but also for Horizon Europe. Um, we'd like to, to, to thank the participation of Pedro Santos, uh, Stefan Waki, um, Augustine Escario, and uh, of course, Fabrício from, from um, EIB. Uh, the presentations and the recording of this webinar will, will be available uh, on the um, access uh, to EIC website. We also um, advise you to follow the access to EIC uh, activities on, the, on our website. And, well, that is all from our side. Thank you very much uh, all, and uh, I wish you a very nice day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye bye, thank you.
Deci, mai de, 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 de,